up over here? Do you think that's everyone? I think there'll be more coming. Oh, yeah, a few more minutes. <laughs> I'm going upstairs, but uh, I don't know what that means. Yeah. I was an MIT undergrad and I never threw out the shirts. I think MIT has a rivalry with Harvard, but Harvard does not have a rivalry with MIT. So wait, should I start something? Okay, so let's start. So we have uh, now Charles Wan from MIT talking about uh, the relationship between superhuman surfaces and PCO. Huh? So hard. Yeah. You does. confused me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm talking about some work that um, Xi Yang and I did on the relationship between super Riemann surfaces and picture changing operators. So can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Cool. So what we'll be talking about here is like so this is doing the most fundamental, most basic starting point of string theory, which is just RNS perturbative uh, super uh, string theory amplitudes. And so there are two different formula formulations for the super string amplitude. The one using that's based off of super Riemann surfaces. And the other is based off the picture changing operators. And this is basically coming from two different gauge fixings of the um, super string world sheet actions. And now one would expect that since these are just two different gauge fixings of the same action, they should give you the same results. But the PCO formalism has some subtleties. So for um, for example, the picture changing operator, this formalism is derived by heuristically, you're setting the gravitino, so it's a super partner of the, of the metric, and you have to set the gravitino to be zero everywhere, except that direct, that direct, <laughs> direct delta functions at specified locations on the Riemann surface. And so you have to regularize this and you have to go make sure that, that in order for the theory to make sense. And then there's also a further subtlety, which is uh, the spear singularities, and this has to be resolved using the vertical integration, and which I'll be dedicating some significant chunk to covering. And because of these subtleties, it's not actually a priori obvious that these two formalisms would give you the same amplitude. And so that's what the most of this talk will be dedicated to showing. <laughs> yeah. So, also, like I will not. So the superstring um, amplitude is expressed as an in both formalisms is expressed expressed as an integral over some some manifold that I'll be describing in more detail later of the string theory integrand, which is, some, is a correlator on the world sheet CFT, and I will not be really dealing with anything that happens at the boundary of moduli space, despite the fact that the string field theory conference. Because this is fixed by unit, this is fixed by like um, IR physical considerations, and the subtleties don't actually have to do anything to do with that. All the subtleties that I'm comparing will be in the completely in the middle of the moduli space. All right. <clears throat> yeah. So, and then also if you have some extra time at the end, still so I'll also be showing how you can use the this correspondence to get some nice set of coordinates for doing type. The doing genus two um, amplitudes. Okay, so the the first let's review a bit of the world sheet CFT that this is operating under, and so recall like, this is coming from gauge fixing the 
um, gauge friction is super gravity action this two-dimensional gra gravity action in this conformal gauge, and you get a CFT with ghosts. So the super C, but since this is a, the road sheet CFT, the road sheet theory is it has an N equals one supersymmetry. This is actually a super symmetry, a super CFT. So everything has a super partner. So we have the Vera Sorrow algebra with the stress energy tensor, but then you also have, the, this gets extended to a super Vera Sorrow algebra with a fermionic partner of the stress energy tensor as well. You have a matter, so you have the position of the x mu fields, um, but then you have the super partner of the phi mu, and then you have the ghost where you have the b and c ghosts, and then you have the super partner beta and gamma. So it's beta and gamma are spinners, but are bosonic to make them ghosts. And then additionally, you have a no potent um, world sheet BRC operator, which is this QB. And um, so, for example, this the BRC operator acting on um, the, B, the B field gives you the stress energy tensor and the BRC action on the super partner, the beta ghost, gives you the super stress energy tensor. And further, you also have, since beta and gamma are bosonic, you can actually define delta beta and delta gamma operators. And an important part of the super string, the, the SRS formalism is I can actually do a delta, so you may just, operator just sort of distribution of a delta over an, a contour integral with the beta. And you can actually show that this is also gives you a well-defined correlator. And it's also common to rewrite the uh, ghosts in terms of some rebosonized operators. So it's this C, eta, and phi, where, the, where you have these formulas for partial, for the rebosonized operators from the original. And even though, for example, you have um, partial C is is only given and is might not be it might not obviously be the case that partial C has a zero um, integral around any operator, but this is true. And because of this, you can actually it's been written down a while ago, like many decades ago, of the explicit formula for all correlators, even with the C field, which is um <laughs> which is only really defined in terms of derivative in this you know, when I gave it here. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, the room. Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. There's. Um. Yeah, I'm not. Ex yeah, not exactly sure, but like it's. Um. Yeah, but if you want to remind sector operators, probably do the same with the spin field, where you just co-calculate how these beta and gamma fields, because they're holomorphic, like how these beta and gamma fields actually on the spin on the on the uh, spin sector operators. And like, you can, I think that's enough data to, to derive the OP stuff that way. But I, I'm, I'm not, but I haven't like read the literature too much on that, on the, that specific case. <laughs> okay. So the first side of this correspondence is the super Riemann surface formalism, which is here you're, so, the, so heuristically, what this, where, where you get the super Riemann surface formalism from is that you have the, you need to fix the super partner of the diffeomorphism, this fermionic gauge symmetry. And you're doing, you're fixing this by setting the gravity node to be zero everywhere except at the boundary between patches. So you define your thing, you want coordinates, so you define the patch by patch, and then you set the gravity to be zero um, except at some specific set of like transition maps between the patches. And so super Riemann surface formalism, you have an integral over a super moduli space of super Riemann surfaces. So every point in this moduli space corresponds to a distinct super Riemann surface. And this is an integral over both bosonic and fermionic parameters. And you have a world sheet correlator here where for every bosonic parameter, you have an insertion of a contour integral of the B ghost which is this um, Mascal B over there. And then for every fermionic parameter, you have an assertion of a, a delta of an integral of the beta ghost. And then you also have the insertion of the vertex operator, which I will, um, since I am including the location of the vertex operator as part of the data of how I'm specifying my Riemann surface, the stuff like the location of the vertex operator is part of these, these T and new parameters. So, the vertex operator insertion always has the C and C twiddles and all of like the correct picture number and stuff like that. And 
the definition of a well, definition of a normal Riemann surface is that you're covering the surface by patches where each of the patches has a single complex bosonic coordinate. And then whenever you have two patches overlap, you need to also specify the data of how these coordinates relate to each other. So like z prime is equal to f of z, where f is some holomorphic function. And this holomorphicity is what's making this a Riemann surface rather than just a two-manifold. A super Riemann surface is similar. So now you have patches with both two coordinates. One is a bosonic complex coordinate, z, and one is a fermionic complex coordinate, theta. I will be playing, I will be basically ignoring anything anti-holomorphic because it's basically behaves the same as the hom homomorphic parts and doesn't really contribute anything um, too interesting. Okay, and this time the transition maps has to be of this form where z is equal to um, this, these formulas. And so the z, i, and theta, i are the coordinates on the i patch, z, j, and theta, and theta, j are the coordinates on the j patch. <clears throat> where th so theta is the fermionic coordinate, z is the bosonic coordinate. And then you have these functions. So f and h are holomorphic bosonic functions. And g is a holomorphic fermionic function. And furthermore, you have this condition on h. So when so h squared has to equal to be this formula here. Right. So Uh, no, no, this is just for a specific i and j. So the entities are not being summed here. There's a curiosity. Any compact uh, closed the Riemann surface is a curve. That is, it can be embedded as a, a curve into a, 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 C2, a C2 or CN. Mm -hmm. Is it true also for a super Riemann? Um, yeah, I think so. There is a algebraic geometry um, formulas, formulation of super Riemann surface. So here, I basically there's an extra piece of there's extra piece of data on a super Riemann surface, um, which is which is like the conformal, which is like some extra extension of the conformal data, and this can actually be exposed algebraic geometrically. And I'll be exploiting this fact um, in the genus two part, but it's not too important here. So yeah. I, I don't still understand the formula. So, so is Z a bosonic complex variable? Okay, so Z and theta are functions on the world sheet. Okay, so Z is a bosonic a holomorphic complex function on the world sheet. Theta is a fermionic uh, function, a fermionic parameter on the, a fermionic coordinate on the world sheet. And now F, G, and H are the transition maps. And these depend on the position of moduli space. So you, you're giving this as part, your Z and theta are not part of the definition of, Z and theta are not part of the data that you provide to create a Riemann surface. These are coordinates on the Riemann surface. F, G, and H are part of the data that you provide to specify a super Riemann surface. So the Z coordinate in some different patch looks like it is a fermionic component. Is that what's written there? No. Z is always bosonic. No, but it has a, it's proportional to theta j, right? Uh, G, G, G is fermionic. G is a fermionic. Oh, G is fermionic. Yeah, oh, yeah G is fermionic. So like F and H are depending on the bosonic parameters of the moduli space, and G is depending on the fermionic modula, the parameters of this moduli space. Okay, so. Right? So yeah. I, I, yeah, no, no, it will, none of these functions, um, so I wrote GIJ of GJ, so, so GIJ is not actually dependent on theta. Um, what GIJ does depend on is these nu's. So you have a bunch of fermionic parameters nu, and this is what these transition maps are depending on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> One, two. So I understand this change of patches now. On the previous transparency, you had this delta of contour integral of beta. Mm -hmm. In what sense is this well defined? How does it transform under the change of patches? You know, you said in the previous transparency it was well defined. Uh, yeah, basic, since each of these delta of beta, so there's going to be beta zero modes corresponding to the number of fermionic parameters. And what these um, 
and what these integral of of the, these delta of integrals of betas are are exactly the put in the exact number of times you need in order to absorb this beta. Yeah, yeah I just wonder how it transforms under a coordinate change. I mean, delta beta transforms like a conformal primary, but I don't think the delta of integral f of z. Of z. I, so what I'm saying is the way you calculate the correlator is to basically just notice that is the basic, there's this, this delta gets eaten up entirely by the beta zero mode, so you just get a determinant factor by the zero. It's not yeah. a, that's not a coordinate invariant statement. No? It, yeah, no, no, the, the, it's integral of a contour that has to be like a well-defined contour, a well-defined contour integral over the super Riemann surface. So long you don't change the patch. No, no you can do it between, I mean, you, 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 like, you can express a contour integral as a sum over pieces where each piece lies within a single patch. And then you can just do the normal transformations that way. So, so there is a there is a co coordinate way invariant way of defining a contour integral over a super Riemann surface, even if the contour spans between multiple patches. Yeah. Well, let me still continue my question. So, if you write uh, theta j g i j, so the j is summed or or the j is not summed. So the z i depends on one particular theta j and not on the other theta j's. So. There, this is a change in coordinates. So I have a coordinates z i and theta i on um, one patch. I have coordinates z j and theta j on the day oh, patch. And on the intersection, I need to specify how what to, how to convert between i and j. Oh, okay. And then if I have three patches intersecting, you have a condition on f g and h, so that if I convert from coordinates i to coordinates j, then from j to k, okay. and then from k okay. to i, okay. this has to be consistent. I'm sorry, I was confused. I thought it was like a basis index, but it's it's a Patch index, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and in fact, if you set g equals zero, like if you set all the fermionic parameters to zero, say g i j equals zero. If you look at the conditions, this is in fact exactly the conditions of a Riemann surface with spin structure, because if you set g equals zero, h is specified um exactly up to a sign, and the sign is what's telling you what the spin structure is. Right, does that make sense? Yeah, it's, uh, what? Theta should be possible to be thought as a one half differential, shouldn't it? Yeah, something like that. But like, um, uh, so is, uh, the transition of uh, one half differential uh, is not really that. I mean, yeah, I think I think theta transforms like this transforms like the square root of the way that um part D D transforms something like that. Yeah. And like this basic you can you can derive this from this relation because you can you can you need to, in order for any something to make sense um over as a part of Riemann surface rather than using coordinates, you have to check how things depend when you do this coordinate transformation and you can re-derive how everything transforms that way. Okay. So this is one side of, so this is the SRS uh, formalism, and you note that all the borsonic parameters are exactly covered by just specifying a Riemann surface with spin structure, but then there's also these extra fermionic parameters that you have to integrate over. But, all right, and so here's the actual formula for these, um, ma ma these con beta contours. So um, it's just an integral over the coordinates this way where it's, <clears throat> Where you have these um, an integral over the z and theta coordinates of of the um, of the super, of like the combined beta and b fields, and then the coordinates um, the rest of the the rest of the definition of the correlator is the depends on the variation of one coordinate with respect to the moduli space parameters while you're holding the other coordinate fixed. And then you are summing over all the pairs of patches i and j, so that you find this a big net of a contour that's covering the entire Riemann surface. <clears throat> okay, and also note that if you have a correlator, um, you can just treat the for if you have the g parameters are zero, this is just a Riemann surface spin structure. This is just the normal like CFT correlator, and you can actually recover the correlators for when g is not zero by just inserting a similar contour over the super partner stress energy tensors over the, the g field. And you can insert a contra integral of that to get what the correlators are when the fermionic parameters are not zero. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. I mean, like, if it, if you have a series of patches that's covering the entire manifold, like, let's say I have these two patches, which are, okay, this thing's falling over, but like, if these two patches, well, then I have a third patch over here. So my contour integral is going like this. And that, that gives you, that will give you the correct answer in the end. Does that make sense? Yeah, but maybe, yeah, you can, you can always find a series of patches with a Riemann surface that always has a, a simply connected intersection. Like it, it, it's, it's not an actually, it's not a problem anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So that's the super Riemann surface side. And so the other side here is the picture changing operators. So this is in, this time you're not integrating over any fermionic parameters. This is just an integral over a bosonic moduli space. So just a moduli space of Riemann surfaces with spin structure. But for every point, for every Riemann surface you're integrating over, you have to pick a set of locations for the PCOs. You, you insert the, P, the correct number of PCOs and you have to pick your locations for these. Where the PCO is just like the, is, is the action of the BRC charge on the C field. Um, and the reason that this is, doesn't give you something trivial is because the C field is not a real field. Um, it's only partial C that's a real field. <laughs> and you can express it, and then you can work everything out and express it as a, um, in, in terms of the beta and delta betas and Gs. And then the PCO integrand is this um, D form over Y, where D is the dimension of the moduli space. And it has an insertion of C plus, uh, it's insertion of the PCO plus, and if the PCO is moving, you have this extra term. And then you have the insertion of the, of the B contours, where you only have B contours, you do not have beta contours, because you're only ever changing the bosonic parameters, and all the fermionic conjugate maps are zero. Okay? Right. And now the main subtlety here is that of spurious singularities. So there are bad locations for the PCOs. You can, you can pick a set of locations for the PCOs where none of the PCOs are colliding with each other. They are not colliding with the um, vertex operator insertion. The vertex operator insertion are not colliding with each other. The Riemann surface is not generating. Everything is normal, but still the integral, the correlator is blowing up. So this is bad, and it's not actually corresponding to any physical trait of the, uh, the not and not corresponding to any expected physical property of the string theory. And so when you're picking location of your PCOs, well, your location of PCOs has to depend continuously on your depending continuously on your on their integral over moduli space. So what is you can imagine a manifold of you where each point in the manifold is specified by a Riemann surface along with the locations of the PCOs. And in order to pick the integration contour, you're picking a section of this manifold. And this section cannot collide with the locus of, this locus of spurious singularities. And for any given Riemann surface, the locus of spurious singularities, this locus of spurious singularities is a complex codimension one, something like that. And any generic choice of locations for the PCOs will be fine. But the problem is that there's no known way to get this to happen globally over an entirety of the moduli space. And in fact, if you want a nice location for the PCO, where the P location of the PCOs are varying holomorphically in the moduli parameters, you can actually show that this is impossible. And can you show this? Or? Um, I think we can show this at some point. Of which ensure that you cannot you cannot you cannot put them holomorphically over the entire moduli space while avoiding fear singularities. This Donagi Witten thing, sorry, this Donagi Witten thing was kind of a super Riemann surface statement, right? It was not a PCO statement. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, actually, yeah, because of the because like the next couple of slides are like so because um when you it would turn out that like that the fact that the super moduli space is not projected implies it's fact. Because, okay, so this is yeah. kind of what I was expecting to be. Yeah. yeah. But it's still possible that the uh, the PCOs could 
very continuously, but not holomorphically. Yes, I, but I'm, I don't, I'm pretty sure there's no actual construction. No one actually managed to construct a thing, but I don't know if anyone's managed to show it's impossible either. Like, uh, it could be possible, it could be impossible, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. But you will not actually need to uh, do this. Okay. Yeah, because, so, so you can always pick the section um, in by, patch by patch. So you can, you can pick the sections over open patches that are covering the moduli space, but it's not known whether you can do it over the, do it a single section over all the moduli space. So what is done instead is that you are interpolating between these patches using this vertical integration procedure that like Stan and Witten um, described in like 2013, 2014 about. And so if you go to the previous slide, you have the, when you're having the location of the PCO is changing, you have the insertion of DC. So you can formally integrate over the location of the PCO along where you're moving the PCO, but holding everything else fixed. And you get an insertion like a C of D1 minus C of D2. So you just manually put this in um, into your, manually insert a term of this form whenever you're jumping from one patch to another, where the uh, location of the PCO is just jumping um, because you weren't able to provide a continuous section over all the moduli space. And this is vertical integration. And you can show that you can, um, if you do the pieces correctly and you insert the right piece when you have three patches that are meeting and stuff like that, you can show that you get a gauge invariant um, amplitude and like unitarity and everything is working out. So the red line here is representing the locus of sphere singularities. And so this is what the section has to not touch. The vertical integration, which is this dotted line, yeah, this formally represented by this dotted line, is allowed to, um, since it's not actually integrating over it, locations, real locations, it's some formal thing, uh, where, because really the PCO location of the PCO is jumping. Um, it's okay if there's some topological obstruction that would have forced the, any actual PCO contour to have hit the sphere singularities. Yeah, not quite integration with dotted line, but inserting a term that is basically what the integral would have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's over this like extended moduli space where I'm including in the moduli space parameters the location of the PCOs. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So I will now show what the correspondence between these two formalisms is at co-dimension zero. So this is away from any of these vertical integration segments. This is just you have the location of the PCOs um, and you want to compare this to the corresponding fewer Riemann surface integral. And this is actually something that's in Polchinski, I believe, um, where you, if you take a location for, that you want your PCO to be at, so let's say it's DA, and it's within some patch of the super Riemann surface. Well, if we have a super Riemann surface with spin structure, you can always construct a, um, sorry, if you have a Riemann surface with spin structure, you can construct a unique super Riemann surface, which has all of its fermionic, all of its GIJs equal to zero. And so then if you pick a location DA, you can get a point inside this, super, this split super Riemann surface. And what I'm going to do is deform the super Riemann surface by doing a little surgery on it. So I first, um, I replace the patch containing the DA with two different patches, this blue patch and the red patch. So in the blue patch, I have the same coordinates as before, but the coordinates are now only defined away from DA, so some fine distance away from DA. And then I have this red patch, which is defined on some small disk containing DA, which has new coordinates W and eta. And then I have to specify the transition map between W and eta and C and theta. And I'm going to pick the transition map to be this. So if I set nu equals zero, I just get the transition map is W equals Z and H equals theta. And this would correspond to no change in the super Riemann surface. So then I turn on this parameter nu A, and this gives you a non-trivial deformation, okay? Yeah, new A is a Grassmann odd modulus. Yeah. 
And then you can calculate the super Riemann surface integrand. You can just go plug in all the parameters. You have a contra integral of G from the deformation that is associated with this transition map. You have the appropriate uh, beta contours as well, delta and delta betas. Um, and once you work out everything and the dust settles, when you integrate over new, you get exactly the operator that you have to insert in the PCO integral. So you have this um, x of dA plus the variation of c of dA. OK, so what this means is that if you pick locations for the PCO, um, and then you do this discoloring procedure on all the locations the PCOs are at, then this actually is giving you a set of coordinates. So because the number of PCOs is exactly the same as the number of odd parameters in the moduli space, what you're doing is actually giving you a set of coordinates on the patch of the supermanifold of this supermoduli space of super Riemann surfaces. And what, is, what you're doing when you are placing the PCOs in is exactly integrating over the fermionic parameters of this moduli space in a patch. Okay, is there any questions so far? Okay, so this is away from the, any vertical integration. And so what's happening when you have, when you aren't having to deal with any vertical integration, when you do have, when you have different locations of PCOs that you have considering simultaneously, well, this actually gives you a different set of coordinates um, between two patches of the moduli space. You're getting two different set of coordinates on them. And it turns out the, if you're integrating over the fermionic parameters, only the bosonic parameters fixed, you're integrating over some, some fiber in, the, in this super moduli space. But these fibers are not going to be agreeing between two different patches. And you actually, this is going to give you a actual contribution to the integral, and you have to figure out how to remove this. And also one more thing um, before I go further is that, well, where the spirit singularity is coming from, there are not any spirit singularities in the super, um, super moduli space, so the super moduli space integrand. And well, actually, uh, if I put the PCOs in the wrong place, if I put the locations of these DAs somewhere, there would be a spirit singularity. Well, what is happening on the super Riemann surface side is that you, your coordinate system is degenerate. You have a degenerate coordinate system where two different set of news give you the same, um, two, two different set of the news give you the exact same super Riemann surface. And because you have degenerate coordinates, this turns out to, be, to me, mean that the integral is blo gives you infinity, blows up. Okay. So before I can actually explain what happens at the vertical integration, um, I have to actually explain Oh, uh, the actual details of what a super manifold is and how you integrate them. Oh, yes. Uh, I can repeat the question if you need. So what is the relation between the, the delta function with fixing of gravitino, gravitino and then your transition function? Usually, we, I, I think you already mentioned that the, usually PC of prescription coming from a yeah, delta function no. Um, parameterization of the gravity, uh, you know. Yeah, and the, the super, so the super Riemann surface is setting the gravity to be zero, except at the boundary between patches. And what is formally happening, what is some heuristic picture of what's happening here is that I, you take the PCO with some delta function for the gravity, and then I cut a little circle, I make a new patch like this, and I cut a little circle around this, this Dirac delta function, and then I do a super conformal, I do a change of coordinates on this little circle. So that the gravity will become zero. And this, but now you have a non-zero transition map between the this new set of coordinates on this little circle and the rest of the, the rest of the Riemann surface. And it's exactly that. Okay, so that's yeah. the result of the, the, the okay, thank you. Yeah, so that, that's that's essentially um sort of a like, path integral way of seeing what's going on. Okay. So first I have to explain a bit the philosophy of the supermanifolds because uh, you, I don't think this is something that people normally think about too much. And something I have to stress is that in a supermanifold, in, in a normal manifold, the coordinates, what you, the coordinates are supposed to mean is that if I vary the value of the coordinates, I'm literally varying the position of a point. So I have a different point 
one point for each different set of choice of the location of the coordinates, choice of the value of the coordinates. But these fermionic directions, these grasping odd directions in the supermoduli space, or in a more general supermanifold, these are not actually real directions per se. This is just an abstract algebraic object for the purpose of integration. And there's not actually a different set of points corresponding to different values for the Grassmann coordinates because, well, how do you give a definite value to a Grassmann odd? There's, there's no definite value for a Grassmann odd um, parameter, which is not zero. Okay. And so instead, you have to sort of substitute a sort of heuristic picture of what these fermionic directions mean. And uh, these fermionic directions, these Grassmann odd directions, are actually all infinitesimal. So you should treat these as treat these and their products as smaller than any finite value. Um, and the reason you should expect this is so let's say I had a no potent bosonic coordinate. So I have a bosonic coordinate epsilon where epsilon squared equals zero. Well, if I have a um, polynomial s of x and I calculate f of x plus epsilon, well, once you go work it out, you literally get the truncated Taylor series. You, you get the f of x plus epsilon times f prime of x, but then it stops because x epsilon squared equals zero. So this is the way you interpret this coordinate is this coordinate can only take infinitesimal value. It has to be smaller than any finite value. It has the value in fact so small that its square is zero. And now if I have a fermionic coordinate, a Grassmann odd coordinate, new one and new two. Well, since new one squared equals zero and new one anticommutes with new two, you get new one times new two, which is a bosonic parameter, that just squares to zero. So, so since the product is infinitesimal, you should expect that new one and new two themselves are infinitesimal as well. And well, since you can't treat these as actual functions over a space, you are forced to take an algebraic geometry sort of point of view to supermanifolds, which is that geometry is not coming from the points, it is in fact coming from the space of functions, so this ring of functions on any open patch. So you keep track of the ring of functions on all open patches, and this is what's giving you your geometry. So for example, on a supermanifold, um, we have some region, the functions on a supermanifold with coordinates um, x and theta can be expressed as a formal power series. So f of xi comma theta a is equal to f zero of xi plus um, f theta theta times f one of xi plus theta theta um, f that should be a two of xi and so on. So this is a form completely formal power series. And so that's what it means to be a function on a supermanifold. And so again, the heuristic picture of, of what this all means is that in supermanifold, you take a normal manifold, which has all the fermionic coordinates at the zero, and then you stick it by some infinitesimal fuzz. And because the supermanifold generally is constructed by gluing together a lot of different patches, and there's no guarantee that the transition function uh, preserves what you mean by setting the, varying the fermionic coordinates to holding the bosonic coordinates fixed, as is what would truly in the case in the moduli space. Um, this is generically not a fiber bundle. If it was a fiber bundle, things would be nice because you could just um, integrate over the fibers and just mean that the, this is pro projected and um, you can just do the integral directly. But this is generically not a fiber bundle and we're gonna have to deal with that. <clears throat> now, since it's not projected, it's actually not even clear what it even means to integrate over a supermanifold because you can integrate over one patch, but I, I never actually give you enough data to specify what happens when you have to integrate over multiple patches. And so now a normal manifold, you're constructed by gluing together patches or attention maps. The supermanifold is you're constructing, you're, you're gluing together patches where you have the attention maps are these formal power, these formal power series in the Grassmannian coordinates. And <clears throat> Note that for any supermanifold um, with specific transition maps, I give actual values. Well, if I give actual values to everything, I cannot have any fermionic parameters. So um, all of the fermionic parameters of the transition maps are zero. And in particular, if I have a fermionic set, the fermionic coordinates are zero on one patch, this is actually a uh, means that the fermionic zero coordinate is zero on the other patches as well. So the fermionic, setting the fermionic coordinate zero is some actual notion on the supermanifold. It's not just a coordinate artifact. And therefore, you can construct a bosonic manifold, um, which is a reduced manifold, by forgetting all the fermionic coordinates. And then I have an inclusion of the reduced manifold 
into the full super manifold where all of the fermion coordinates are zero. And so, for example, in the case of super moduli space, this reduced space is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces with spin structure. And then this includes, it has an inclusion by the split super Riemann surfaces into the full moduli space. And so this is a rather complicated example. Here's a simple example where I am gluing together two patches. Uh, one has, so this is a one bosonic direction. So one Grassmann even direction, two Grassmann odd directions. Um, and you have coordinates t comma nu one comma nu two on one patch where t has to be less than some small positive number. And they have a coordinate t twiddle nu one and nu two uh, where t twiddle is larger than a small negative number. Uh, and then you have a transition map where t twiddle is equal to t plus nu one times nu two. And notice that the I note that idea of saying t is constant when varying nu one and nu two. If I set t equals some z zero and varying nu one and nu two, this means that t twiddle is not actually staying at zero. So t twiddle is changing. So where the fibers are not matching across these two different um, set of coordinates. Right, so that's a simple example of a supermanifold. Well, how do you integrate to a supermanifold? And integration, well, first you have to define integral form. What the integral form is, is that it's a integral form on each of the patches, such that they match with the appropriate rescaling term on, associated with the coordinates, uh, change of coordinates, so it's a chain rule, like change of coordinates, um, when you have overlap between two patches. Um, so for example, in this simple supermanifold earlier, I can have a um, integral form, which is of, of this form on the two patches of the, the supermanifold. And the way you integrate it, well, the way the mathematicians define this is you integrate using a partition of unity. So you can find, you can always find a set of functions, fa, where fa, um, where there's one function for each patch. So the support of the function um, is some closed region, uh, which is actually included up inside um, each its associated patch, inside a single patch. And then the sum of all these functions over the whole, sum of all these functions at every point, at every single region is equal to one exactly. So then the way you do the integral is you integrate over the entire modulation, some entire super manifold of the integral form omega. This is just a sum over the integral over each patch. And you know how to integrate over a patch because it's just a normal integral d theta of theta equals one, integral d theta of one equals zero, um, that integral. And you can integrate over each patch of the function times integral form. So this is mathematically convenient, but this is not physically convenient because I, it's, it's very bad to try to analytically integrate a bump function. Um, well, yeah, there's no way to do it like, or, or like machine learning or something. Um, and so what we're doing instead is trying to find a easier way that's going to correspond to vertical integration. And the way you're going to do this is by interpolation. So in a normal manifold, you do not, if you want to integrate over the integral form over the manifold, you don't actually need to get a um, isomorphism with the manifold. Your integration contour, this has to have all the boundaries cancel and on any given region, cover the total number of times it covers that region is exactly once. <clears throat> so this will turn out to be the same here in the supermanifold. All you need in order to get the correct value of an integral on a supermanifold is to cancel all the boundary terms. So you calculate the boundary of your contour and that boundary has to be zero in order for the integral to make sense. <clears throat> in order for the integral to be given the correct value. So here, I'm going to, I'm going to cancel this boundary. So I have one, so if I integrate from t to from uh, minus infinity to zero and integrate t twiddle from zero to infinity, there's actually two boundaries here. One is t equals zero and one is t twiddle equals zero. And since you have this non-trivial transition map, well, if you said t equals zero, very new one and new two, t twiddle equals new one times new two, which is not zero. So the boundary terms are not canceling. I'm going to cancel this boundary term by adding a new piece so notice if I have a contour integral over the complex plane, I, I parameterize the complex, I find some function f of lambda, which is going to parameterize your, um, your contour and then integrate over lambda of the pullback of the integral form. Same thing here, um, I'm going to have this formal parameter s, which is varying from zero one, which is like this parameter lambda in the contour, in the complex um, integration contour. And then I'm setting the function to say that f so that I'm also integrating over new one and new two. 
and T is equal to minus S times new one times new two. So two boundaries here, S equals zero and S equals one. If S equals zero, then T equals zero. And if I vary new one and new two, T is staying zero. And therefore it's, ca it's canceling the T patch uh, boundary that I need to get rid of. If I said S equals one and T equals minus new one times new two, so T twiddle is equal to zero. And therefore this cancels the other, uh, the other boundary I need to remove. So when I add this together, the, everything, all the boundaries cancel, and I get an integral exactly once over this supermanifold. <laughs> and then you can calculate what the pullback integral form is, this, this um, function here. And then when you integrate, well, the integral is pulling out the new one times new two terms. So you get a total of the integral is this integral here. And when you, you get some final result. <laughs> and notice here that so I cut it at zero, but I could have cut it at epsilon or minus epsilon or some other value. And notice how you need to have this interpolation piece, this integral from zero to one of f of zero ds. This interpolation piece is necessary in order to give you a consistent result. Because if I remove this piece, the, the sum of these two terms will depend on where I cut. It will depend on the value of zero that I chose. Uh, well, it, yeah? I'm saying that this is, uh, equivalent to the, uh, the integration but using the partition of unity? It will give you the same answer. Okay. okay, so which is what matters in the end. Okay, so you need the interpolation term in order to give you the correct answer in the end. And then when you, this is between two patches. So more generally, um, if you have a, you take the reduced space, you split it into patches, open a cover by open patches, um, and you want this, this splitting, and then I split into closed regions by like, literally like cutting it with a knife basically. And I wanted it to be, it to be a dual triangulation so that um, at only two ever, between um, a code dimension one thing, only ever, you only ever have two, two domains meeting. At code dimension two, I only ever have three code domains meeting. So you don't have four or something like that. Um, at, code dimension, um, at code dimension three, you have like three, three, like three things, four things meeting or whatever and stuff like that. So like it's just the opposite of triangulation. So, um, it, it looks like, it looks like this, not this. Okay. So the patch like one, two, three, four. <laughs> okay. Um, I have accidentally clicked the clicker. Um, and then, so, so for each given patch, according to mention zero, you just integrate the normal Berezinian way of integrating over the fermionic fibers while holding the Boson coordinates fixed. And then in, you have to close integration contour with this interpolation. I mean, so if I have a, if I have a <clears throat> um, code dimension one thing between two patches, I have an it, parameter S varying from zero to one, which is a one simplex. Um, and then I integrate over the, the code dimension one inter intersection between the two domains, and I integrate over the fermionic coordinates. And then I have this map of this into the manifold. And you have to do this in a way that cancels the, cancels the boundaries. And then code dimension two, you have to have a little triangle region you're integrating over. Code dimension three, you have a tetrahedron, and so on and so forth. And eventually, you will be able to cover the entire moduli space without boundaries, and this will give you the correct integral when you sum over everything. Does that make sense so far? Any questions? Here? Yeah. The second line? The second line is just the sum of the first, is just the value of the first line. Yeah, because when you when you do this calculation over here, you get an f of um, minus s new one new two. But this, since you already have new one and new two, and new one new two squared equals zero, you can just set that equal zero, and you change the answer. <clears throat> Prime is derivative, yes. It's derivative with respect to the is the derivative of that. Any more questions? Okay, so what does it have to do with the PCOs? So in the PCO case, I have, let's say I have two locations of the PCO and I have to figure out how to interpolate between location one of the PCO at DA and location of the PCO being at DA prime. Now, if I didn't have this interpolation procedure and only had the actual PCO, then I would have had to try to somehow drag the location of the DA, all, this PCO all the way over to DA prime. 
But then you're gonna hit a bunch of random crap with this beer singularity and stuff like that, and you can have topological obstructions that you aren't able to get around. So what I'll be doing instead is essentially jumping straight from ZA to ZA prime without going to any point in between. And so you have these two parameters that you're disk cutting. So the new A parameter, the new A prime parameter. And I'm going to turn on both of these at once. Okay. So you can make sort of a heuristic um, two-dimensional plot of new A and X, of new A and new A prime. And then when I add when the PTO is here, I'm very new A, well, setting new A prime equals zero. So I'm going like this back and forth. Uh, when I had the PCO at DA prime holding new A fixed, um, I have going up and down like this while holding new A equals zero. And the way I'm going to interpolate, it just set the value of the new A to just vary like this, to just tilt the fiber. And so mathematically, I have a new set of coordinates, D, sorry, S, which is the same as before, varying from zero to one, and new A double prime, which is a fermionic parameter. And then I said new A is equal to R times one minus S times new A double prime, where R is some non-zero number I get to fix. And new A prime is equal to R prime times S times new A double prime, where R prime is another number I get to fix, non-zero. Um, and notice here when S equals zero, new A is varying, new A prime is equal to zero. When S equals one, new A is zero, new A prime I'm varying. So this indeed interpolates over the these two fibers. And the reason that you have to have these R and R prime terms is that if you choose them wrong, um, you could actually have this. So let's say in this previous example over here, I had done like something silly. I had a parameter new, new one double prime. And I said new one is equal to one minus two S times new one double prime. This would have been bad because when S equals zero, uh, it would be saying that new one is equal to zero times new one double prime. And it could be a coordinate generation. And as I said before, when you have a coordinate generation, the integral blows up. So that's bad um, when you have a fermionic coordinate generation. So here I'm picking new and new at R and R prime. You can always pick values of R and R prime so that you always avoid these coordinate generations. Make sense? Okay. And then when you integrate of the integrate the super mod surface integrand over um, S and new double prime. So you get exactly the vertical integration contribution. And so this is what lets you give you the, at core dimension one, this is what's recovering your vertical integration. If you have, so this is just moving one PCO. If multiple PCOs need to move, I just move them one at a time, okay? So I, I sum over a bunch of pieces. So one has the location one PCO change, the location PCO two changes on the next piece, location PCO three changes on the next piece, so on and so forth. Okay. So then, at um, higher co dimensions, so this is just between the boundary two patches. If I have three patches intersecting on some co dimension two thing, I was thinking about little two dimension two dimensional interpolations, and a similar is a similar approach to the co dimension one case, where I am splitting together this interpolation into a bunch of discrete moves, which I can then analyze. And so, for example, in co dimension two, I can have one PCO change in location in three different locations. So a PCO location, PCO at ZA, ZA prime, ZA double prime. And you can calculate the interpolation piece and the interpolation piece is zero. And I can also have the other, a different commut commutator sort of relation where this one's shaped like a square. And this side of the square is PCO one moving, then PCO two moving. And the other side of the square is PCO um, two moving first and then PCO one moving. So we have their, these, each of these have their own locations. And this actually gives you a product of C's, the difference C of D1 minus C of D2 type stuff. And this is also, again, matching the specification of vertical integration that's given by a Senate Witten. Okay. So then after you go work out all this, um, all of these higher dimension things and go analyze their values, what you get is that your, you get exact, you show that the integrals Aside from the boundary terms at the boundary to modulized space, these integrals are giving you the exact, calculating the exact same thing. So what this PCO integrand is doing is that I have a set of coordinates on patches and you're integrating over the fermionic fibers of each of the patches, but then the fibers are mismatched between the, between the, at the, between the boundaries of these patches. And you have to add this interpolation term which is what this vertical integration term um, or the PCO formalism is. 
And then so this vertical integration is the contribution of the interpolating segments. And then you, this is required in order to get the integral to float. OK, so before I move to genus two, does anyone have any questions? OK, so I think it's a little, a little bit more time. But so let's, so now we'll talk a bit about the applying all this to genus two, because, well, this is basically the expected result of you have a super ring on surface, PTO would be the same. If they were not the same, this would have been a, a big disaster and it would be important news, but they are the same. So like um, string theory is safe for now. Um, so, but actually if you apply this sort of procedure for the genus two, this actually gives you a pretty nice set of coordinates of you, and it seems like this might be useful for calculating the genus two amplitude. So the way you're going to provide these nice coordinates here is first of all, for the bosonic moduli space of Riemann surfaces, uh, genus two is actually a very convenient um, parameterization of this using the algebraic geometry fact that all genus two curves are hyperelliptic. So what this means is that every genus two Riemann surface, you can express this as a double cover of a sphere with these um, with six branch points. So it's a double cover of the sphere, six branch points. This turns out to correspond to taking um, two spheres and getting together with three handles, which is genus two. And it turns out that every genus two Riemann surface can be done, can be expressed in this way. And this expression is basically unique. So it's unique up to permuting these branch points and the SL2, C automorphisms of the sphere. Does that make sense? Any questions? <clears throat> okay. And then the spin structure. So first of all, you have an automorphism. Um, this is called like parity in the paper. So like you are interchanging between the two sheets. It's not actually, it's not actually a parity because you're not actually um change in orientation, um, but it is effectively a 180 degree location according to the, when you look at each branch point. So you look at each branch point, see what it's doing doing a 180 degree rotation. And because you have a spin structure, this parity actually has a degree four. It's, this parity is actually order four because if you square it, you get a 360 degree rotation, which is this fermion involution that flips the sign of everything fermionic. So if you have a fermionic thing on here, so every bionic thing has either plus or minus one parity, Every fermionic thing has a plus or minus i parity. Okay. Um, and so the way you express the spin structure is that you can check how what this parity operation does on the fermionic coordinates at each branch point. And each the fermionic coordinate at each branch point has either parity plus i or minus i. So this splits you into, this splits the branch point into two types. Even spin structure is you have an even three three split of the types of branch points. Odd spin structure is you have a five comma one split. So you have a majority type and this minority type. And this specifies the spin structure. And you can do the counting, this gives you the, this gives you the correct value. Um, now, algebraic geometry, you're doing the algebraic geometry way, you can construct this branch cover by this equation. You're saying this equation of y squared is equal to f of x, where f of x is a degree six polynomial. And well, it, it has a degree six polynomial, it has six roots, so therefore six branch points. And then you have to also do a little um, stuff in infinity to make sure that you actually close it to a sphere and make sure that everything works out correctly. Sound good so far? Any questions? Right. right. <clears throat> so first of all, um, about sphere singularities, there's actually a convenient choice of the PCOs, which would be useful here which is that it would turn out that if you place the PCOs on the branch points and one on where one of the PC, you have two PCOs to place. Um, and if you put one on each type in the even spin structure and both on the majority type in the odd spin structure, you actually get no sphere singularities, okay? But you still have to deal with this change in location of PCOs because we go around an orbifold point. So you go around a point where you have to interchange the location of these branch points. You have to deal with the, the change of PCO movement as well. If you have the boundary, boundary moduli space, you have to have a spe specific location of the PCO in order to in order to get the things to match out correctly. So you have a constraint that still require you to be moving the PCO around. You still have to calculate the transition maps. Okay. So now the previous stuff is all very algebraic geometry about algebraic geometry sort of fashion. So I need to figure out, so it's actually also a very nice algebraic geometry description of a super Riemann surface structure. So instead of saying that transition maps has to be this specific form, 
I will instead provide the super read monster chirping structure as a piece of extra data on the on on the um algebraic geometry on this variety with one but one com one complex bosonic and one complex uh, fermionic coordinate. So what I'm gonna do is so we have a something with a one bosonic, one fermionic coordinate with arbitrary junction maps. Um but then I have to specify a super read chirping structure which is a, in math terminology, a totally non-integral rank zero comma one sub-bundle in a tangent bundle. What this really means is that you have a fermion differential operator D. So in the canonical form that was given originally at the beginning of the talk, this, that, this, this D operator is equal to partial theta plus theta partial Z. And then you take the uncommutator of it by itself. This is something that's proportional to partial Z, which is not zero. And the specification of a super remote service structure is that you have this differential operator D, which is not necessarily in this canonical form. And then it's defined up to local rescaling, so I can multiply it by some F holomorphic F of Z. Um, and then this between me moving between different patches. And then the end accommodator D by itself is everywhere non-zero. Any questions so far? Okay. So the spin structure, I need to split the branch points, which are roots of this F polynomial, into two types. And so therefore the spin structure is this factorization of X, F into these two polynomials at P of X and Q of X. Uh, and then I'm going to, there's a convenient number, convenient function alpha, which has equal to Y over P of X, which is equal to Q of X over Y. This is parity odd and has like, a, has a pole whenever P of X has a zero and has a zero whenever Q of X has a zero. Okay. Right. So the split super, so now I can give you the split super remote surface coordinates. Um, H, uh, I have two, patch, two patches for the, co the fermionic coordinates, H and tau. So H is non-degenerate when P of X equals, no, does not equal zero. So it's not, when it's not at one of these P of X equals zero branch points. Um, so an even spin structure P and Q are degree three. Um, an odd spin structure where you can, well, you can, there, you can, Interchange P and Q without causing any problems. So you give you the same super remote surface. So an odd spin structure, um, you can choose. I think the choice later is going to be P, P of X is degree one, Q of X is degree five, or something like that. But it doesn't really matter which one is which. Okay. Yeah. So the question was like, oh, what exactly are the degrees of P and Q? <clears throat> okay. So in the split case where you don't have any fermionic parameters, I can, I'm going to find the two coordinates on two patches, H and tau. H is non-degenerate where P of X is non-zero. Yeah, tau is non-degenerate when Q of X is non-zero. Um, and the transition map is that tau is equal to this alpha function, which is defined up here, is alpha times eta. And then you have to also specify in order to make it the super remote surface, you also have to specify this um, fermion differential operator and the finally follows. So, so D and eta is equal to partial eta plus alpha times eta times partial X. And then this is proportional to the corresponding uh, interchange of eta and tau version as well. Okay. Um, any questions? Right. So then I place down the PCOs. So as I said before, you can always avoid bare singularities by placing on the PCOs um, where you have an on spin structure you, which has a five one for the branch points. Um, you place, place both of the PCOs on the majority type. So there's more, two out of these five branch points. On an even spin structure, you have a three, three split, and I put one on each type. And this always avoids pure singularities. And in fact, if you place the PCOs on the branch points in other, any other way, you get a PCO, and you get a pure singularity every time. This is because of some, this is because of the parity of the fermionic parameters. Because uh, the parity of the even spin structure, you have two fermionic parameters, and the parities will turn out to be opposite. So one's plus i, one's minus i. And this means that the PCO, which has corresponds to some parameter with the fixed parity has to be one of each type. The odd spin structure, the two parity, um, the two parities, right, the parities of the two parameters are both the same type, which means that the, both of the PCOs have to be on the majority spin structure. That's right, a majority uh, branch point. Okay? Right. And then I'm going to insert the same disk length because we wanted on this earlier. Um, it's written like this for mathematics. So I think this, um, this f of prime of x over y is just this f prime of x multiplication is just for convenience. And this is equivalent to the um, canonical form as earlier, it's just you have to do a little bit of coordinate transformations and stuff like that, and you have to rescale new. But it's fundamentally the same thing. And you can just do this PCO, 
and I can define a deformed Jupiter Moon on surface in this way, and this will give me a corn, set of coordinates on the moduli, this genus 2 supermoduli space. Okay. So what happens in the odd spin structure? So I have a starting piece of locations. So I, let's say I start them at branch points x1 and x2. So these xi's are the locations of the branch point, which is one set, one set of bosonic parameters. And then I have these fermion parameters, mu1 and mu2, and I've got these starting piece of locations. Then I want to express the same super Riemann surface. So I want to keep the super Riemann surface the same, but I express it in terms of the PCOs at, different, at a different set of locations. So I need to do some coordinate transformation on the super Riemann surface so that I, it's of the form of where you, where you would have got if you had the PCO locations at location, say, x3 and x2. So I moved the uh, PCO x1 to x3. Um, and then I have to find new set values for the coordinates of new positions of the branch points, new values of the Fermionic coordinates, so that this gives you the same super Riemann surface you started with. And this is what it means to be the transition map on a super, on a super moduli space. OK? Now, um, an odd spin structure is of this form. So you can see that actually the location of the, the location of the branch points is completely unaffected. So as a matter of fact, the odd spin structure, the genus two odd spin structure of the supermanifold, the supermodulized spaces is projected. No matter where you put the PCOs on the branch point, so long as it, it makes sense, you actually get the exact same set of fermionic fibers. So there's no, you can actually check the PCO integral. You can insert the C of D1 minus C of D2. And indeed, you can check the correlators and get the correlator equals zero. Um, so you don't actually get any vertical contribution, integration contribution here. And the reason this is happening is, well, xi is a parity plus one thing. But with the new one and new two, they have the same parity plus, or plus i or minus i, depending on your conventions. But they have the same parity, same imaginary parity. Well, the only, whoops, the only term that could possibly deform xi is something proportional to the product of new one and new two. Well, the product in u1 and u2 has a parity minus one, is a product of is a square of an imaginary number. And therefore, the parity is wrong and you don't actually get any term. Okay? Make sense so far? Okay. That's an odd spin structure. And in the even spin structure, you are not, this parity argument does not apply. And you do indeed get a non zero vertical integration contribution. You can go calculate it. And it's, a, it's this formula here. Where it turns out that in fact this time the new and the new two coordinates are matching on both sides, but the location of the branch point is not. So you can, so when I move branch point x1 from x1 to x3, I get the, the location of the branch point. I didn't the jump. I get the location of the branch point two, moving by this infinitesimal amount, which is proportional to the product of these fermionic parameters. And <clears throat> I'm not going to give the formula here. But you can also work out everything else to, to, match out, to match up with this period matrix projection that is uh, used by Dokkan and Fong in their uh, genus 2 calculations. But uh, yeah, so this is the even spin structure case. And like you can see here, this is like an explicit example of how, these, how this corresponds to being a super Riemann surface moduli space and this PCO works in a super string integral um, at genus two. And, this, and also note that in this case that um, this is a branch cover, it's branch double cover. So you can actually calculate this as essentially a sphere correlator over where you have a bunch of these twist operators corresponding to um, each of the branch points. So this really, genus two, if you do use these coordinates, the genus two amplitude is really behaving a lot like a, a if you have a genus two NS, NS amplitude, this is actually behaving a lot like a, a, a N plus six, sorry. If a genus two endpoint NS amplitude, this is actually behaving a lot like an N plus six point um, RSN, um, RNS tree level amplitude as well. All right. So this is all I have. Anyone have any questions? Uh, 20 minutes for discussion, so we can start. I mean, all of this is about computing 
un peu sur Ramon, Ramon Fields. Otherwise, the, un peu sur le nouveau Schwartz Fields are, are known from the 80s. So, are you able to compute uh, un peu sur le Ramon, Ramon Fields? Uh, yeah, you can, you can. It's like, I, I'm not exactly sure if it has this nice um, fear characterization, but like, it's definitely well defined. It's, you, you just have to do it over the genome. No, but, uh, Will you do it? One thing is uh, theoretically you can do. One thing you you can you do it. You you will do it, or it is theoretically possible. But uh, yeah, yeah, the spin structure changes. So like the spin structure, even when when you have a Raman field, the spin structure changes when you move around it. Oh, um, where I did not where I didn't actually include any of that here. So you have to, yeah, there's calculation changes, but like yeah, you have to, you can deal with it like presumably. You can write down an explicit expression with integration on the. Uh, classical moduli space uh, of uh, of uh, 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 of a uh, genus to Riemann surface. Yeah, it should be possible algebraically because it like be possible, possible or it is possible. I haven't calculated it, but I would guess that it's possible. <laughs> this is perhaps like something you can do in the future. <laughs> Anyone else? Could you? Go back to the slide where you were showing this plus minus thing with the f of s. And just which which slide is this? No, the, no, the one. Yeah, this one. Okay. Could you just explain one more where this extra piece came from? I missed the uh, just what what was the source of this twenty one? Okay. Yeah. So the reason it is because if I were to just integrate over um g new one and new two where whoops, where uh, t is less than zero and t total is greater than zero. This will actually not cover your, this will give you the wrong answer. It will not match the bump, this bump function definition. And the reason it won't match is because you actually have a non-zero boundary because the boundary of t equals zero and the boundary of t total equals zero are not matching. So I need to add an extra term to cancel this boundary if I want to match with this, with this partition of unity definition. So if I don't include the interpolation piece, you just get the wrong answer, basically. Like you need to, you need to cancel the. Like it, it will be as if I was trying to integrate over a manifold, um, over a sphere or something, and I decided to give up on um integrating over the equator, and I just say, okay, I'm just going to integrate over the north pole, where some epsilon away from the equator, and integrate over the southern hemisphere, some epsilon away from the equator. I just give up on the equator. It won't give you the correct integral, um, over the sphere. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like it's in this case, you don't have to deal with any Jacobian factor. So um you can just plug it in. Um dt is equal to um minus ds new times new one times new two plus m new one and d new one and d new terms, but this actually cancels with the d these insertion of d one d one d new two. So you actually just get the dt is effectively minus ds times new one times new two. And then, yeah, and then you plug t equals s minus s times u1 times u2 here. And I can expand this in power series. So this will be f of 0 plus negative s times u1 times u2 times f prime of 0. But I already have a u1 u2 factor here from the ds. So u1 times u2 times u1 times u2 is equal to u1 squared times u2 squared, which is equal to 0. And well, with the, well, g of, when you have the g of t term, you can plug it in. Well, I already have a new one times new two here. I have another new one times new two from the dt, and this also gives you zero. Like, so the, the, because the new one times new two is square to zero again. Same what you have here. Yeah, yeah. So if I just take this and just do the change of coordinates, you just get, you get that. It, it's, it's a surprisingly simple calculation. Yeah. Um. So um, you are sh showing this. Uh, we are talking about these these fields uh, to compute uh, like uh, to to loop amplitudes. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you are, are you really able to compute the correlation functions with these these fields that create branch cuts? And um, so are they known to which degree? So what so what is known about these these fields? And perhaps that's. A, I mean, like I, I this is very yeah, well I, don't know, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have like the full specification, but um. You should, you, should, you should basically basically be able to constrain this by using the fact that you have the anti periodicity of, of of the difference of x. You can, I can make fields um, x1 plus the x on the first sheet and the x on the bottom sheet. Uh -huh. And this, you have the sum, which is periodic, and you have the difference is anti periodic. You need to go calculate the OPEs 
and I think this should be enough, but I, I, I haven't actually calculated the amplitude um, and I checked. Do you know it. whether they are primary fields, uh, the, 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 their weight? Uh, you know, um, the, yeah, I, I, haven't again, like, this is, I, mean, I haven't actually um, checked, the, checked the, this sort of field interpretation. Like, this, is being, this is just suggested by um, this um, branch cut. Um, the, this this parameterization of genus G yeah, by yeah, these branch yeah, cuts, yeah. but like um, so I don't know the full details of what this what this like double CFT looks like, but I think it's some standard it's some standard replica trick thing, and like someone else has calculated it. Apparently, like someone else should have there should be someone else should have been able to calculate figure out how to calculate the correlator some, mm -hmm. um, somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So in your genus two example, mm -hmm. how do you know the location of spurious singularity? Um. Well, the way I calculate the location of the spirit singularities is um, the simplest way to literally just calculate the um, tangent vectors in the fermionic space of this new one and new two coordinates um, by calculating the beta zero modes. And then you can just go examine the parities. You can do the parity argument. And this will, this will show that the, the, the coordinates of the system will be degenerating. Um, the tangent vectors are, will, be, will be not be linear and independent. Your coordinate system is degenerating when you, do not have, when you put the PCOs in the wrong way. So and you can also explicitly you can explicitly calculate so there's an explicit formula for the um for the repositionized system so this um C eta phi system there's an explicit formula for the correlators written down a long time ago and you can explicitly you just go through that too and you also show that you, you're getting this spirit singularities when you put the PCOs in the wrong place. Yeah. By the way, the, uh, there seems to be something wrong with uh, your equation twenty and uh, twenty nine. 29, if I remember correctly. So yeah. I think, oh yeah, yeah, there should be a new one here. I've got to fix that. So this should be plus, it shouldn't be plus, right? Yeah, it should be x1 over x13 over x23 times new one. I made a typo. Okay. Yeah. More questions? I have a question too, if, if that's okay. Uh, yes. So does a BRST exact insertion into the path integral in the super Riemann surface framework produce a total derivative in super moduli space? And how is the answer affected by a choice of gauge slice? Um, what exactly mean in this case? Like, so what, what is BRST exact insertion are you talking about? Or is it like so any, if you, anyone? Yes, so if you just insert a BRST exact vertex operator into the path integral mm -hmm. in, the, in the usual sort of bosonic, bosonic string theory, that mm -hmm. is known to produce a total derivative in super yeah. modular in modular space. So I'm wondering what happens in the super Riemann surface framework if that continues to hold, or if there are further subtleties that haven't been understood yet. Yeah, like yeah, you get you get a you get a total derivative, so the integral is zero except for boundary terms. But I I already said I'm not dealing with boundary terms. But ha has this been shown that you get a total I derivative mean, in the like, for arbitrary genus or genus two? Or in which case has it been shown? And but and where where can I find that? I mean, it's the derivation shouldn't be too hard because it's from the fact that the that the Q acting on this B, the B and beta fields are giving you T and G. So when so I mean, they have this contour of B of B and uh, beta, these B and beta contours, when I insert a when I actually on by the BRST on this, I'm getting a, get a contour of the G and T, but that's exactly the infinitesimal deformation of the Riemann surface. So this is, this is where you're getting, this is how you derive the, um, how you derive this formula where the cube acting on the court on these meta terms gives you the, a, a total derivative in the moduli space. So does that depend on having chosen a gauge slice, uh, the Gravitino the delta what function? Like, what do you mean by the gauge slice uh, the, here? So it, it, gauge slice in, in the super moduli space. So the fact that have you chosen the Gravitino to be a delta function? Oh, no, no, the gravity is not a delta function here. It's it's concentrated on the boundary. Oh, it's not. Do you mean do you mean the, the concentrated on the boundary between the patches? So, yes. I'm referring to the actual gauge slice that you choose to compute the integral of a, of a supermoduli space, right? So you can either think of the this before you make the choice of gauge slice. In other words, before you. Before you choose the Gravitino delta function supported gauge slice, which gives you the PCO prescription, or you can ask this question before you make any choices, right? I, I so mean, if you... I'm, not, I'm not I'm not familiar with the like the old on the old literature, but like um basically, I mean presumably this means is 
is this talking about are you talking about like the choice of how you need how you align the fibers at at the boundary of moduli space? Because there's uh, not really any not really. because, because I mean, not at the boundary of when you're not at the boundary of the moduli space, there's not there's not any choices. It's just the integral of an integral form over a super manifold. There's nothing you can choose. There's, there's no there's no opportunity to choose anything. Well, the thing is that if you so the original path integral that you started from mm -hmm. has a delta function with a B ghost insertions, right? And the, so you have in general some, uh, yeah, these cat, math cal B news terms, right? That you, I think you wrote the math, math cal B, delta function of a math cal B. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, you the, mean like that delta function? Okay, that, 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 okay. Yes, yeah. yes, that one. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you commute the BRST operator through that operator, that delta function, then the question is whether this actually produces a total derivative in supermodular space or whether it actually produces something more complicated and whether this has actually been looked into. Um, yeah, I, I think this should be, it should be true by, it should be um, the direct other function by definition, um, but I, um, there might, I don't think there should be a stability, but like I cannot fully, I cannot guarantee that. Um, yeah, okay, but basically, okay, so, yeah, but anyways, in this core, uh, this is defined um, basically as a one over determinant. You just basically pull this out and do a one over determinant of the variation of the beta zero modes. So I, yeah, I don't worry about too much, I guess. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, maybe. Maybe we can discuss it at some other point, actually, because yeah, yeah, it's uh, I, don't, I find it to be a, a bit subtle. Yeah. Who's asking the question? But, I cannot see your. Cannot sorry, see your zoom it, it's 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 Dimit Dimitris Kleros. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Can I thanks, add comment to that? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in the vertical integration formulation, I mean, this is in fact uh, the way we derived the formalism, right? So it, it is a total derivative. And since this work shows the equivalent between vertical integration and the SRS, it should be true here also. That it becomes a total derivative. But I don't think I heard it clearly. Okay. Or so has this been shown in the in your vertical integration paper with Edward? Yeah, 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 yeah. In the vertical integration paper, in fact, this is one of the uh, uh, ingredients that you wanted to. I mean, you have to give the uh, choose the prescription in such a way that this works. Yeah. Okay, so so it's shown that that it gives a total derivative in 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 the in moduli space, right? Not super moduli space. Right. Yeah. So is this after after integrating out the odd moduli? Yeah. So it gives boundary terms. Yeah. At the end. Okay. Right. And so and, in this is equivalent to the super Riemann surface formalism. This will also give terms which is only at the boundary of the moduli space. So so do you know what happens before you before integrating out the odd moduli? If you ask the same question before integrating out the odd moduli, oh, um, like the question about like um where the delta of beta is, you, you, you could expand in terms of delta primes. So, so uh, whether whether you get a total derivative in super moduli space in that case, as one might. Yeah, yeah, expect. you do. Like, but yeah, but almost by definition, like you, you, you essentially, they, you, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it, yeah this is basically the property that expects that fixes the formula to be this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Th um, okay. Thanks for thanks for all your comments. Mm -hmm. Are there more questions here or online? Right. Yeah. Thank you all for listening to my talk. <laughs> yeah. Let's thank uh, Charles again. <laughs> so we'll have a coffee break now. And then in 30 minutes, we can start the discussion.